you were designing your poster or traveling and reading about the other three pillars? What were some themes or ideas that most stood out to you? Collaboration. one way to do it. We're going to sit in rows, we're going to sit 
the teacher. The teacher is the embodiment of all the knowledge and power. Um, our children's school experience is very different. The idea is that we're sharing that responsibility of being the owner of the knowledge. And the teacher doesn't have to be that vessel of knowledge any longer. We've got Google, for crying out loud. Like, we can give our kids the opportunity and the uh, experience of finding information, discovering information, and using that um, leading with their interests to make it more interesting and to make that learning more powerful and more sticky. So it does look different than our experience, and that is a good thing. Now, we're going to hear from Ms. Gallenkamp, one of the fourth grade teachers here, and some of her amazing students that are doing awesome work. And this is just going to give you a little window into what the LCN actually looks like on this campus right now. Hi, so yeah, I'm Ashley Gallenkamp, and I'm a fourth grade math and science teacher. And um, in thinking about the learner-centric model that we're incorporating into our classrooms, my biggest takeaway is that it guarantees an opportunity for success for every single learner, no matter what their personality type is or what their learning style may be or what their special needs um, may have been identified as. When I think back to my early years of teaching, um, I had a completely different mindset. Um, I can remember having my students work at a desk, out of a textbook, from start to finish, and I can remember being praised on having the quietest, most well-behaved classroom. And the learner-centric model, essentially, um, to my teacher perspective, is that it shifts the focus from what might be best for the teacher, right? Quiet, peaceful environment where everyone's doing, working like robots, you know, doing exactly what I'm asking, and shifting that to um, doing what's best for each child. Um, so a big part of the learner-centric model in our classroom is building a sense of community and opportunities for leadership. We do that through a lot of group work and opportunities that our friends are going to talk to you about here, such as being our coach that's basically co-teacher that they volunteer to do um, as they see fit. So maybe one day they feel really confident about a math or a science skill that we're learning. They throw on a coach badge, you see a few of our friends, and then our classmates know that they don't have to wait for me if they're a timid learner. They don't have to approach a big, scary teacher, right? They can go to friends who are professing that they feel comfortable helping others, and that they're with whatever the skill is that we're learning at the time. So we have students who are great, um, have great strengths academically. We have students who have great strengths technologically. So we also have tech experts. I think you see a couple of our badges up here as well. And a lot of our learning is online now, and things go wrong, students get frustrated. We have these touch screens where they're manipulating all sorts of numbers. Um, they also can um, seek out support from their classmates. Um, with our online learning. Um, another part of the learner-centric model is making sure that our kids feel safe taking risks. So we spend a lot of time learning about what we call famous failures, like Bill Gates, Disney, Michael Phelps. Things go wrong in their life, but the important thing is they get back up. So we learn that school's tough. Fourth grade math is hard, but it's part of the journey, and every time we make a mistake, it's not that our life is over for that day, but we're one step closer to learn to getting to our end goal. Um, one of our class's favorite examples is hearing the story of this sweet little boy, Joseph, who at the 2008 Olympics meets Michael Phelps as his biggest fan. And then he says, Michael Phelps, I'm going to try to beat you one day. And so we get to hear about all of the adults in his life who are like, oh yeah, that's cute, but I'm not sure how realistic that is. And then fast forward to the 2016 Olympics, that goal actually came true. Um, so we do a big focus on growth mindset, focusing on the journey, not necessarily, um, I got an 85 on this test and I was hoping for a 90, but I started at 45 <coughs> with a pre-assessment and I grew all the way to, thank you. My um, all the way to an 85 or whatever it may be. Um, we do a lot of focusing on learning about our friends' learning styles and team player styles. So at the beginning of the year, we take a little self-assessment to figure out which category we fit into. And we learn about the characteristics associated with that learning or team player style. And it helps us throughout the rest of the year 
to be able to respond to those who were or think differently than ourselves. And we often refer back to that, like, oh, this is frustrating to you because remember you're an Easterner and you like to get things done fast, and this is a Westerner and you have a lot of questions. So how can y'all talk this out? Um, we went to an ALE training a few years back, and we got to listen to a few interviews from CEOs who were talking about the most <coughs> important skill sets that they're looking for in tomorrow's employees. And it was all of the soft skills that the state mandates aren't really setting our classrooms up to support. And so the learner-centric model does just that. We're building communication skills, we're building empathy, we're building perseverance when life gets tough. Um, and we're uh, allowing a creative outlet, which I'm going to get to hear about here shortly, um, for our students so that we're not forcing them to just fit into a box that the state says they should fit into. Um, but we're you know, looking at the whole child and setting them up um, to be successful in a lot of different ways. So what we have here are a few um, non-proud, shy friends who were willing to come see you this morning. And we talked in kid-friendly terms about what a learner-centered classroom looks like and feels like. And then they each said, oh, I recognize that in when we do A, B, C. And they're each going to have a talking point on what most connected with them that's tied to our learner-centered model. Hi, my name is Haley, and I will be talking about how we help each other learn. Partnerships, groups, and talks. Hi, my name is Ireland, and I will be talking about projects. Hi, my name is Ella, and I'm going to be talking about early finishers. Hi, my name is McKenna, and I'll be talking about Genius Hour. Hi, my name is Elizabeth, and I'm going to talk. I'm going to be talking about filling up the classroom. Hi, my name is Megan, and I'll be talking about math groups and flexible seating. We are really just working together like one big family. We hope our, <coughs> we hope leader class is learning because Ms. Callan Camp has projects we can do, and we get to choose which project is best for us. I love that we get to choose the projects or come up with our own instead of having Ms. Callan Camp choose because if she chose, it might not be on our comfort level. <laughs> I also love making our class posters so that people can be informed. We get to hang them in the neighborhood and around the school so that no matter what class you're in, you can still learn about what we're learning. When we make our learning posters, we get to decide what pieces of information and strategies are most important, in our opinion, to focus on. We get to show off what we, what we feel like we're really good at. When I get to show off something I'm good at, I feel proud. We also get to share our learning by making cahoots. Cahoots are online games about whatever we're learning in math and science, and our whole class plays them when we're done. Not only can our class play them, but any teacher or student on the Kahoot site can play the games we make. We can help anyone around the world learn the same topics we're learning about, and there are tons of other ways we are encouraged to help our classmates learn too. Here, Ms. Gallantamp gives us this. We can choose which project we want to do. There's roller coaster research, and it shows you how to do it. There's a math professor poster, you're in charge, let's cahoot it. There's also a free choice where you get to choose your own, as long as Ms. Gallantamp's okay with it. I also normally work as a coach during math and science class. This is the coach's badge. It means that when friends need help, they come to you and ask for help. It means that you know how to help people. It's not just a privilege. If you feel like you'd be good at it, you can go and grab one. And when friends need help, they'll come up to you and ask you for help. They know that you're a coach because you'll be wearing a coach badge around your neck. And there are, and they don't have to feel scared to ask because these people actually volunteered. It makes the people in our class feel safe, so we all feel like a big family. This year, we spend a lot of time working in groups. This makes our classroom more open and safe for our family. We help take care of each other in these groups by directing team in different ways. 
Like when we have jobs such as coach, tech expert, investigator, reader, and team captains. Whenever we stick, whenever we're stuck, we can use our team's investigator or coach. We can lean on each other when we're working in groups, and that makes me feel comfortable. Let's miss G taught us how to do our jobs. We started getting to pick what we felt was comfortable doing. This also helps everyone feel safe and really confident that they they're not in an uncomfortable situation. Depending on the com how com uncomfortable you feel, we can change the groups we work in or we can work individually too. We get to share ideas and learning with our class, with the rest of the school community. When we work, when we work together in groups, we can talk about our different ideas until we feel comfortable about our own answers. We've learned how to be really supportive so that all of us can feel safe when we're working with partners. And we also end up learning twice as much when we get to teach someone else. Here's an example of our groups. So sometimes when we used to do Texas Tornado, these are like some people, she could put us in a group, and then we could say if we want to work individual or not. And eventually, after some time, after gaining each other's trust, we got to go in our own groups. a project that fits me best. Doing the projects for math and science helps me learn because I get to teach others about what I know how to do. My favorite project was making, making a multiplication strategy chart for my class to use when they don't know their facts. This helped me get better as I was making it. And then it helped my classmates get better when they got to use it. There is a piece of paper that has projects on it. You get to choose a project that you want, then you can hang it up in the hallway. So now the hallway is filled with math and science that you should learn. And this is the chart that we have a lot of other stuff, and like these two. Another thing we get to choose is how we use our time when we're done with our learning activities. Whenever we're done, we don't have to stick to one thing. We have multiple options to choose from based on the ideas that are important to our class, and you can pick the one that suits you best. Our class shares ideas, and everyone comes up with our early finishers options together. My favorite early finishers option is creative. In the creative category, we can create learning games for our classmates, we can build like engineers with Legos. We can create science models using Tinker Crates and more. We also have Tech It, unfinished work from any class, not just Miss G's, Genius Hour, and Reading. We have multiple options to choose from in these categories. We have multiple options to choose from in these categories on when deciding how to use our time for our best interests. especially when you can't focus as well. 
When I can sit at my favorite spot, it makes me feel better. I love this class so much because I get to spend time with my friends and work at, and learn all at the same time. Flexible seating gives us more than just one option of where to sit. We don't have to pick one spot and stay there. We can pick spots where we're most comfortable in the, either the neighborhood or the classroom. I pick my spot where it's not too loud and where I feel comfortable. Ms. G always tells us to go where we learn best. In our math group, we get to decide what activities are best for us. So since I'm already 100% in reflex math, I get to choose which advanced skill I'm going to learn about instead. It's usually the fifth or sixth grade math skill that is most similar to the fourth grade skill we're learning about. When we're practicing our math skills during stations, we also get to pick which problems would best show how well we understand what we're learning. And we get to pick which strategy works best for our brain. For example, with the multiplication problem, I might choose to use standard algorithm, and Ella might choose partial products or box method. We get to decide what works best for us. We can also decide how we're using our time during the stations. So if I need to spend more time than my friend on finishing a science activity, that's okay. They can work on their study island while I'm working on science. Ms. G checks in with us each day to make sure we're on the right track. And we can also look at the smart board to check to see what we're supposed to be doing. Any questions? <laughs> Ms. Gumpro? So, how is all of this preparing you for your managing your time, decisions for yourself, working with personalities, and different personalities? So, for mine, it helps because you can help other people in the future. Like when you have a job, if someone needs help, you can help them. You know how to help people, and yeah. <laughs> you can always lean on a friend, and you'll always have someone. Um, what my mom said at the airport when I was flying to Chicago once is there was this um, old woman who had broken legs and my mom felt bad for her because she couldn't buy any food. And so my mom went up there and she bought her some food. So you will always have a friend to lean on. How my um, late is because um, if my mom is a teacher and she, you know, teachers have to write stuff down and make projects for um, the classmates, the students, and it helps them learn. So mine can relate for the teachers. Mine relates because whenever you get older, you're gonna have to be able to work wisely because you're in control of yourself and nobody else's. How is that bridge 
being bridged. So the question was, the state standards mm -hmm. are different yes. than what we're talking about at the LCA. So where's the bridge? I just, I'm sure that you, that's been thought about. Yeah. yeah. So I think, yeah, the bridge is, is the LCA is the vehicle to get there, right? We still teach our TEKS, right? We still have our uh, Texas Essential Knowledge of Skills. We teach those every day. It's, this is just the vehicle, right? to teach those skills okay. in, a, in a way that um, promotes critical thinking, right? We can teach those skills in isolation, right? Kind of going back to what she said uh, our, uh, from the TED Talk is, we can teach them algorithm, and they can probably regurgitate that algorithm to you, but how is it purposeful to them? So the LCM is really bringing purpose to why we're doing what we're doing, and why you're learning what you're learning, um, why are you learning uh, slope intercept, right? Why are you learning those things when you get to middle school? Um, so this just gives us that vehicle. So the bridge is that this is our philosophy of teaching those skills and why do we need them down the line? Yeah, I think about it as the what, we have a what, a why, and a how. The what of state standards, the very like specific explicit skills and pieces of knowledge. The how and the why is our LCM. Okay. I remember some of the fourth grade math different ways of doing the same thing. And they're asked on tests, okay, you need to do this test this particular way and show it. Now if you're teaching with this model, they're like, hey, we're going to show you all these different ways, but it clicks this way for this kid, this way for this kid, then why are you asking them to do it this particular way? You know, if you're, it's kind of contradicting what you Yeah, so, and this is a big thing for math. So with math, there's a history of procedural teaching, and it's like the standard algorithm. And we're trying, our state standards are kind of moving us back into the direction of conceptual understanding. And so a lot of that conceptual piece are the multiple ways. So looking at different models, strip diagrams, number <coughs> ones, things like that, help build a level of understanding in a child that supports them in more difficult concepts. So the state is asking us to expose and really get kids comfortable with identifying all those different models. And it's really more about representing and being able to identify representation more so than having the kid create each of those types of representations. So it's kind of two different things that are happening. It's can you take an equation and <coughs> see what it looks like with a strip diagram or a pictorial model of some kind? Can you do that? But then when you have to create it from scratch, then you get to choose the one that makes the best sense for your brain. So. So um, it's being kind of addressed in a lot of different ways here. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so half of us are going to be going to the new school. Yes. Um, so there's going to be a lot of new teachers being hired. Sure. Is this going to be brought up as part of the hiring process that for we want teachers with that open mindset? And, and you know, <coughs> we're already trying to, we're trying to get the ship going. Mm -hmm. We don't, I mean, we can't discriminate against, but you have to, you want the right people for the job to be fit. Sure, yeah, so that's, that's it. Our mind. Great point. Yes, um, this is a district initiative. Right? So we are all on board, all of us are on board. And so I would imagine when looking at the hiring process for a principal, right, those would be questions that you'd be asking as a district initiative. Those would be um, probably at the forefront of that hiring process. When we are looking at teachers to hire here, we're looking at those, you know, that mindset also, right? Our word this year as a campus is growth. You know, every kid can grow, right? We have our high achievers who need to grow. We have our kiddos who struggle that need to grow. We've got our kiddos that are just kind of in the middle that need to grow. So as a campus this year, our, our focus is growth. Um, in talking to principals across, we have the uh, principal PLCs. This is being rolled out to us as principals and the assistant principals as well. Um, we all get together through the LT curriculum. Um, does this with all of us and we do learning walks throughout. Um, I went to BK and I took the learner profile. Um, our teachers haven't seen the learner profile yet um, because we haven't had staff development to do that yet. <laughs> so we will um, at our new staff development. Um, but we as as campus leaders go through campuses too and, and get great ideas at other campuses and how they're doing and what they're doing and it's a nice we have our own PLC. Um, we have this open collaboration that is amazing across the district. So I don't think that you'll, I think you'll see crossover is what I guess I'm getting at. Um, and we look for those, those qualities that um, teachers when we're hiring as well, if that helps. Does that answer your question? Kind of. Yes. Sure. Um, 
No. So what um, some districts call their learner profile, they call it a graduate profile, but it is intended to be from our youngest learners to our oldest learners. And even within the district I mentioned earlier, we're all learners, so Dr. Lancaster is a learner. And the 18-month-old in our child development center is a learner. And so this is for every child in our system. Um, it starts here, but the idea is that it is to continue. And what's really cool, some of the authentic learning experiences that happen at the high school are mind-blowing. They do um, passion projects, and students have created businesses from those projects at like, the junior and senior level. So this is happening across all my levels. Do you find that that language is being used with the teacher? So we have to learn how to model what it is learning alongside, or are we finding that that's so like the teacher's student dynamic here? Because I feel like that's a big transition. So um, I would love to 
email, whatever, any ideas that you guys have about how we can open that conversation up and get parents to maybe pull back a little bit, the pressure, right? My kid came home with a little straight A ribbon yesterday and I was like, oh my God, I want to burn Like, <laughs> I don't want to start this conversation and build this little perfectionist because I know that life, it's a hard life, and I want better for my kid. Um, so yeah, anything that you guys have for suggestions? So, you know, I know when I was growing up, um, we had textbooks. So like, if I had a problem with my math